All right, welcome back. So this video is a follow-up to a previous video about using a Synology in your household. In this video, we're gonna take a deeper dive into my particular setup as a working example. And so my Synology is supporting a household with four people, and the data needs to be accessed both inside and outside the house. There's several terabytes of data to store, probably about four, but it, there isn't a high read or write rate on the data. The main function of our Synology is centralized, high availability storage. And for that reason, I went with uh, the Synology RS822 Plus model, since I wanted a rack mount option, and I didn't think I would need more than four drive bays for the foreseeable future. And I just started with two Seagate Ironwolf Pro 18 terabyte drives. These drives are configured in a single volume using SHR1 as the file system, which gives a total of about 16.4 terabytes of storage. And I went with SHR1, over RAID because SHR1 supports different drive sizes. And when I go to add another drive, I want the flexibility of be being able to pick a different size. And as an aside, I was super excited about SHR1 and its ability to mix drive sizes because this was one of the promises of Windows storage spaces, which I tried many years ago when it came out. I never got it working in a reliable way. Features like data scrubbing are enabled, but I'm not using a hot spare and I'm not using SSD caching Again, mainly because of the use case of this isn't a high read and write server. The shared folders are set up with data integrity protection, which stores additional checksum data with each file, and it goes hand in hand with the data scrubbing process. The folders aren't encrypted because I want to be able to pull out a drive and access the data directly if needed. Again, this is one of those trade-offs you make when you set up the system. If you want to be super secure about your data, such that if you had a break in and someone physically stole the drive, um, and you want to protect against that, you can go ahead and encrypt it. I, I was willing to take the trade-off on that one. And then as another layer of protection, I have snapshot replication enabled on the most important shared folders. The shared folder data is regularly backed up to a local TrueNAS machine and periodically to a USB drive. And then finally, the most important data is backed up offsite to S3. Now, the reason I use the TrueNAS machine is I happen to have an old PC sitting around and for fun, I installed TrueNAS on it. It was actually one of my old machines running Windows storage spaces, so it is filled with consumer-grade hard drives. And I'm like, well, we might as well put them to use, so I threw TrueNAS on it, and it is serving as a local backup in the house. Now, as far as applications are concerned, Synology Drive is really the workhorse application in this setup. Across the house, all file files are accessed using Synology Drive, not through direct file shares or SMB access. The reason is Synology Drive has an interface that everyone understands. People just install the Synology Drive client and then access files using File Explorer, where it just looks like the files are local on the device, or they're either, they are either local or they are kind of on the, the cloud um, and can be brought to the device very quickly. Like I said, the Synology Drive interface is one that everyone understands. Also, it maintains, on top of everything the Synology does, Synology Drive itself maintains additional file versions and allows, like I said, files to be stored locally on each machine, which makes it really nice for performance. And beyond that, Synology Drive has a mobile app allowing users, mostly me in this case, to view files when they're away from the PC. Now, I also mentioned that remote access is a requirement, and I am using Synology's Quick Connect for remote access. I have tried other options, including setting up a WireGuard VPN through my Unified Dream Machine. I've also tried Zero Tier and some of those other uh, products, but in, in some cases I did prefer them, like the WireGuard VPN was super nice and uh, Zero, Zero Tier was interesting, but really the complexity of setting those up and managing them just didn't work for family situations. Asking someone to connect to a VPN when they're outside the house, just it wasn't gonna work. Uh, the other thing I found was that Nothing worked on, you know, the computers that I use from the office. So I have a work laptop and I do like to access my files from that. Quick Connect was the only option. So Quick Connect is currently my go-to choice for remote access. Now, I will note that each Quick Connect client is configured differently. Or to say it differently, each Synology Drive client is configured differently. So for machines that will never leave the home network, the Synology Drive client is configured to use the local IP address of the Synology device, but said differently, it doesn't actually go through Quick Connect. And then for mobile devices or laptops that will leave the home, 
the client is configured using the Quick Connect ID, and that's only like a device or two. So most of the devices around the house that are set up with the Synology Drive client are accessing it directly through the IP address. And it's also worth noting that the Synology sets on a separate VLAN from other devices around the house, and there are routing rules to really lock down which devices in the house can access the Synology. And this is all done using a unified Dream Machine Pro. And then Synology Photos is set up and indexing photo and video data from all the shared folders. It's great, it did a nice job, even though it took a few days to get the indexes running. But I'm finding basically it gets zero use. People in the house are happy to just browse photo photos and videos using the File Explorer directly from Synology Drive. To back up photos from my iPhone to the Synology, I did try using the Synology Photos application, but I hit all kinds of problems on the initial sync where it's going through my entire library of photos on the phone and uploading them to the Synology, it kept failing. So given that, I did switch to the DS Photo Backup app, which is not free, it costs a few dollars a month, but it worked flawlessly and handled the initial sync without any problems. And so I'm happy to spend a few dollars to support the developer on this one. And when I did hit a few problems, with the DS Photo Backup app, particularly with the MFA authentication, the developer responded super quickly and I was able to get my problems resolved right away. So they deserve a, a couple dollars and that's been great. So now let's talk about my personal workflow. I did have to change a few things in order to really move away from the cloud. As I mentioned, I do everything through files synchronized using Synology Drive. I even use it for dealing with camera footage and video editing, just like this video. What I do is I throw all my files onto the Synology Drive synced folder on my editing computer, which is also a gaming uh, PC. And all that data is stored locally on an SSD. And I do my work on the SSD using DaVinci Resolve. And that folder is then backed up to Synology, my Synology using Synology Drive. And it all happens in the background. So basically I get the speed of local SSD editing while the, the data is safely stored back to the Synology when I'm all finished. Now, I'm not doing a ton of video editing and I'm not sharing files with anyone else in the house when it comes to video editing. So this use case works perfectly fine for my purposes. I have seen there are other videos out there that content creators have made looking in how to use a Synology that is set up with SSDs or NVMe drives and they're able to just with and then 10 gigabyte networking to just really edit files off their laptop very quickly. That is not a use case I'm solving for. I have a really nice gaming PC with SSD storage. So I'm really just editing the files locally and letting Synology Drive move them back to the Synology device for uh, security. And my network is only one gigabit. And so, yep, sometimes it does take some time to move all that data back to the server, but Again, like I said, in my use case, it's just fine. I moved all of my docs and spreadsheets out of Google tools, and I did go back to using Microsoft Office. Now, you know, I do pay for an Office subscription because it's super useful for other people in the family and useful for schools and things like that. Um, if you don't wanna go down the route of using Microsoft tools and, and paying that uh, subscription fee, there are options like Synology Office or even Nextcloud where you can host it yourself and that may be a great option for you. Now, in moving fully back to Microsoft Office, I found everything worked great, but what I was missing was a note-taking tool. And I tried for some period of time, just like opening a Word doc of to-do lists or notes and scribbling some stuff in there, but that felt super weird and it wasn't fast or organized or anything else. So to solve this, I actually went back to OneNote, which is something I've used in the past and have used extensively at work as well. And I actually really enjoy it as a product. So I can set up OneNote on devices around the house and my notebooks are synced using Synology Drive and everything works perfectly. The one thing I haven't solved with OneNote is I haven't figured out how to get mobile OneNote working with Synology Drive on my phone. So quick phone-based note-taking still doesn't work very well. I end up like sending myself a message in Signal or an email or something else. Again, like Nextcloud or Synology Office may be a good solution to this, but it's not a burning problem right now. And you know I don't have to take notes on my phone very often. And then as far as additional apps on the Synology itself, the only one I really run is Git Server. Uh, I do have Plex Media Server installed, but I'm finding 
similar to Synology Photos, it just doesn't get much use. Everything else I'm running is running on other home lab devices. So things like Pi-hole, uh, Homar, etc. And the main reason I do that is I did happen to have some extra hardware around and I wanted to keep this Synology clean since it is used by other people in the household. So what about future expansion? Now I did look into upgrading the stop stock two gigabytes of RAM and adding a 10 gigabyte network interface. But at this point, neither of these would add any value. Sure, things would be a little faster on the network. I'd probably have to upgrade other aspects of my network as well so it wouldn't be cheap. I might go down the route of adding one additional drive as I'm starting to play around with some data movement, which is taking up more space than I anticipated. But other than that, the Synology is working just fine and I'm super happy with it the way it is. And maybe that's the key point. Since the Synology is serving the entire house, I try to keep it simple and make sure it always works. If I wanna play around with a piece of software in a home lab way, I use a separate piece of hardware. So that pretty much wraps it up. The Synology has really been a game changer for my household. And hopefully this video shed a little bit of light on how it could work from you and showed you a couple use cases from one user in the ecosystem. With that, we'll leave it here and we'll see you next time.